next talk is on persistent memory new tier or storage replacement. Um, it's uh, co-speakers, Kimberly Keaton and Susan Spence. Uh, Kimberly is a distinguished technologist at Hewlett Packard Labs, where her research focuses on data management for memory-driven computer architectures. Her prior research includes storage and information management, NoSQL databases, intelligent storage, and workload characterization. But first, we hear from Susan Spence, a senior research engineer with Hewlett Packard Enterprise, working on managed data structures <coughs> software for the machine at Hewlett Packard Labs. Her current research is, focuses on ease of programming and data sharing for data structures created and used directly in persistent memory. Please welcome. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? <coughs> okay. Um, so, uh, what we would like to do today is uh, discuss how you might actually use persistent memory. Um, what I would like to do is uh, talk to you about, uh, introduce some of the notion of uh, how persistent memory blurs the boundaries between memory and storage, uh, and then talk a little bit about the context within which we work in this at Hewlett Packard Labs, um, our memory driven computing uh, architecture as the, the work, uh, the context for our work with persistent memory. Now, I know that a number of you have heard uh, a number of talks now about persistent memory, so I'm not going to dwell too much on the technologies itself um, and the, the infrastructure. Uh, we, our intention is to spend most of the time in this talk talking about how you might actually use persistent memory from a software perspective. I'm going to go through a couple of software examples to illustrate this. Um, first, uh, talking about it in the uh, context of um, using persistent memory as byte addressable memory. Um, and then uh, uh, pass over to my colleague Kim, who will uh, go into uh, uh, some other examples and talk about the challenges for using persistent memory as storage and try and get some dialogue going on that. Uh, so uh, I've noticed there have been a couple of variations on this graph shown over the last few days. Um, as you're aware, uh, today the technologies tend to fall uh, in this sort of spectrum where at, at one side you have uh, very low latency technologies uh, but with small capacity um, like SRAM and uh, DRAM and then at the other end of the scale you have these much larger capacity technologies. What we're seeing now is that there are multiple entries. I've actually seen more than two. <laughs> um, but to, to describe uh, just a couple of these, um, we're seeing, for example, on package DRAM with massive bandwidth um, compared to the alternatives at that level um, of low latency. And then a variety of non-volatile memory or persistent memory technologies in the middle of that space, faster than flash or disk, um, and approaching the access speeds of DRAM today. Um, so I will note uh, that unlike uh, the SNEA uh, uh, programming uh, group, that NVM programming group uh, talked earlier uh, in this uh, session, uh, we are using NVM and persistent memory as interchangeable terms here, um, so you should not read too much into our use of one or the other in this talk. Okay, quick definition of terms uh, in, in terms of non-volatile memory, as a number of you are aware. There are a variety of technologies in this space with different characteristics, um, ranging from NVDIMM-N, where that has very low latency, um, close to DRAM access speeds, um, to other uh, types of technologies along the way, RERAM, um, phase change memory, etc. Um, and so there are a variety of, of uh, type characteristics in how you access them and how you use them and what sort of uh, performance you're going to get when you do use them. Um, but the ones that we're particularly interested in are those where you can use byte addressable access to the memory. And not only do we think of it in terms of the non-volatile memory technologies themselves when it comes to actually writing the software to use them, we're also interested in the interconnects to actually get access to this memory. Um, Gen Z is one of a number of interconnects that are out there, um, one that has been promoted by uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, we've, there's a consortium with more than 30 companies now involved um, looking at uh, using the Gen Z spec and actually uh, developing reference architectures for this spec. The benefits of this particular protocol, this particular specification, are in particular the ability to globally address very large pools of non-volatile memory, where the fabric 
um, that you actually uh, have available to you here. You run the Gen Z protocol over. It enables you to um, connect multiple heterogeneous processors, both CPUs and a variety of accelerators can be connected to this fabric. And then they all have access to um, fabric attached non-volatile memory uh, on the same fabric. And the ability that uh, the things that Gen Z provides you are the ability to globally address for one CPU, for example, or SOC to actually address any of the memory that is directly attached to this fabric. Um, and this gives you um, high bandwidth access to the memory and access to very large pools of memory. And it's these types of technologies, both the combination of the persistent memory technologies and the fabric attached memory uh, um, um, uh, capabilities that enable you to progress from the conventional um, architectures which are processor centric over towards ones which are more memory driven centric architectures. So for us, when we talk about this in Hewlett Packard Enterprise, when we think about what it means to be working in a memory driven computing context, we're interested in the fast persistent memory available to us, the fast memory fabric, um, task specific processing, and then the opportunities for new and adapted software to take full advantage of these capabilities. It's that last one that we want to focus on today. Um, HP has made significant progress in the memory driven computing space, uh, announced this year uh, the world's largest single memory computer uh, with 160 terabytes of fabric attached memory using this type of memory driven architecture. <coughs> and 40 physical nodes, and in particular, using optical interconnects. Uh, we have an X1 um, photonics module that enables us to access um, this memory uh, very efficiently um, and over um, a very high bandwidth interconnects. Um, so this gives us uh, uh, significant advantages that we want to take advantage of when, we, when it comes to actually programming this. So when we put it together, what we actually want to do is converge memory and storage. That's what we're looking at here. Being able to say what, what happens from, what are the implications for so, store, sorry, what are the implications for software if we actually move to a byte addressable persistent memory model, replacing hard drives and SSDs? Um, what happens when we actually have this resource disaggregation, um, where we have this very high capacity, large pool of shared memory, all attached to directly to this memory fabric, um, how can we take full advantage of that? Um, the, one of the uh, advantages of uh, this type of fabric attached memory is uh, it, uh, we, it has very, uh, we use te topologies that enable us to have um, very uh, near, near uniform low latency access to all of the pool of memory um, from any of the SOCs or other processing components that are attached to that fabric. And this gives us a very um, low latency, high performance tier as a result. Um, oh, sorry, that, that's actually re referring to the volatile memory. <laughs> okay, um, so then the question is, how does the software take advantage of that? Um, we have the ability uh, to deliver memory speed persistence. We have the ability to have direct access over this fabric to these large pools of memory. But it should be noted that um, for this type of architecture that we're talking about, this is non-coherent accesses between compute nodes. And we also need to consider the implications of that. So if you consider memory-driven computing in this context, this means that conventionally we have worked either in a shared nothing architecture, um, as shown on the left, um, where you have um, SOCs each with their own DRAM and their own um, non-volatile memory technology um, and they are sharing nothing with, uh, in principle with SOCs um, uh, on the other uh, parts of the network or we have a shared everything architecture um, where we have a coherent interconnect ensuring that we can use these in a coherent, uh, the, all of the um, uh, DRAM and or NVM in a coherent way across the whole fabric. But when we actually move to the architecture that we're working in uh, now, we're looking at something that we call a shared something architecture, um, where each of the SOCs has, has its local DRAM, but any of the SOCs can access any of this shared large pool of non-volatile memory across the fabric. 
So the questions driving the memory driven computing software work that we've been doing in Hewlett Packard Labs include, how do I use persistent memory? How do I take full advantage of byte addressable persistent memory? How do I share data safely uh, in a large globally addressable pool of memory? And in particular, ensure data consistency in the face of failures and errors, this is clearly important to customers using it. And as we get larger, this pool of memory gets larger, how do we scale effectively to make real good use of this large memory, uh, many core systems? Um, we tend to look uh, at the uh, software uh, to address these technologies in, in, in terms of, of three different vectors here. Um, first, we consider uh, that memory is large, um, and how to address that, how best to take advantage of that. We also consider memory is persistent um, and memory is shared non-coherently over this fabric. Um, and there are opportunities in all these spaces. Um, for example, uh, where memory is large, we can uh, have very large in-memory data structures tailored with the implementations tailored specifically for these very large memory systems. And we can create very large indexes, reduce storage access, using taking full advantage of this uh, large memory. Where memory is shared um, over the fabric, we have the ability to move from a model where in order for different storage nodes to process over the same data, they no longer have to copy that data in one phase of operation from one SOC to another node um, to uh, operate over the same data in the next phase of operation. They just simply pass a reference to the shared data in this shared pool of memory. This enables all, you also to do things like have multiple processes communicate through the memory. One writes to the shared memory, another one reads from it. And it enables easier load balancing. No longer do you actually have to copy data in order to reassign work from one processor to another. You simply pass a reference to where the data is and the other processor can take over the work that was previously done by an overloaded processor and more load balance the work more easily and much more quickly across these multiple nodes in the system. And where memory is persistent, opportunities include um, no storage overheads if you're working with things in memory that also happens to be persistent memory, fast snapshots, fast checkpointing. These are some of the things we've been able to demonstrate with uh, the software that we've developed for persistent memory. And that means uh, that we've been able to develop a, a, a memory-driven computing developer toolkit to explore all these different areas. Um, and uh, we have a, a number of different uh, software that uh, falls into, some of them fall into the intersection. So we have some software addressing large memory, some large persistent memory, some large shared memory, and a uh, variety of these. And all these uh, bits of software are we've developed and made available open source in, uh, as this toolkit to enable other people to see how we have explored the challenges and opportunities of using large memory, shared memory, persistent memory, and what APIs we're using to take advantage of uh, persistent and uh, fabric attached memory. <coughs> so let me talk about uh, a couple of examples. Um, of uh, the software that we have uh, developed and, and made available open source through this toolkit to give you some examples of how we use it. Um, the first example here um, is our write-ahead logging library. Um, we see persistent memory uh, as a natural fit for improving database workloads. Um, and we've explored a number of different uh, opportunities in this space for improving database performance, database throughput, by using persistent memory, and byte, particularly byte addressable persistent memory in this space. Um, so for write ahead logging, uh, we are in particularly focusing on the aspects of uh, uh, the fact that uh, the logging uh, is really your bottleneck when it comes to database throughput. And if you can lower the latency to get, uh, get uh, those um, log entries to persistent state, you increase the throughput, throughput of your system. The persistency latency is critical to your transaction performance. So uh, I'm sure many of you are fam uh, familiar with uh, uh, write ahead logging in principle. The key things here are um, ensuring all the modifications associated with a transaction are written to the log um, and ensuring that those changes are persisted, are persisted um, in the write ahead log uh, to a persistent state. Traditionally, that's been done by writing to flash or disk 
What we've been doing is experimenting with how to take full advantage of non-volatile memory technologies, particularly NVDIMM-N in this case, to enable low latency logging. Um, so one of the things that we've done is we've been using uh, the uh, technology from um, our ProLiant persistent memory servers. They're battery-backed NVDIMMs, which enable you to write to uh, persistent memory with uh, DRAM access speeds, um, but ensuring per persistence of the data that is written to those NVDIMMs. Um, so this gives us the best performance, the lowest latency for data access and for data writes. Um, and the, uh, it's backed by NAND flash, which ensures persistent storage for the NVDIMMs. Now, in the initial experiments we did, uh, we did it with a, a very limited capacity uh, to start with, um, just using a simple 8 gigabyte NVDIMM um, to actually see uh, what, we, what advantage we could take, even if we have just a very small amount of persistent memory to play with. And we find that um, what we could do is um, uh, write the uh, log entries, the tail of the log, to the NVDIMM. Um, it does require us to truncate the log because we don't have a lot of space to play with on that 8 gigabyte NVDIMM. Um, and therefore, we have to checkpoint the database, that type of thing. Um, but it does give very good results. It enables us to store the tail of the log in the NVDIMM and then in the background destage the log to the disk for capacity. The application doesn't have to worry about the details of doing that destaging. It's all taken care of in the uh, write-ahead logging library for persistent memory. Um, so they don't have to deal with the application logic involved there. And it does significantly improve performance for a uh, MySQL benchmark that we tried. Now, having said that uh, we worked there with an 8 gigabyte NVDIMM, um, I would like to point out that um, on the persistent memory servers that ProLiant is serving to, uh, selling today, the Gen 9 ones, there is actually 120, up, to, uh, up to 128 gigabytes of, of um, battery-backed NVDIMMs um, on those servers today. And with the scalable persistent memory um, uh, servers that are coming in Gen 10, second half of this year, um, this goes up to a terabyte of persistent memory available that you'll be able to buy and use this year for persistent memory. So as we head up to a terabyte of persistent memory available to us, then there are many whole databases that you could actually accommodate in persistent memory, not just the log or the tail of the log. Um, and we want to think more generally about how you can actually take full advantage of um, these uh, uh, persistent memory technologies and particularly byte addressable persistent memory technologies using these types of approaches, using approaches that, that, that uh, take full advantage. Consider, for example, that a traditional database system has multiple software layers, each with their own <coughs> format of the same data. So your application is working with data structures. That's what your programmer really wants to work with. Um, so they make changes in their data structures. Those data structures then, um, typically if you're working in Java, for example, then get translated from your Java data structure representation to some relational representation for the database, um, then get pushed through the client, through the server. The um, relational database table re representation in memory gets written to pages, gets written out through the buffer cache, and ultimately ends up in sectors on flash or disk. Um, so then the, the question is, well, you have a lot of different data formats for the same data that you have to maintain at different layers of your software. That's a lot of overhead um, in, in a variety of different dimensions that you have to maintain. What if you just had a single layer of software, your application, plus a runtime library linked directly into your application that enables you to create and use data structures directly in persistent memory, have those data structures persist your data um, um, as a, in this single representation, rather than having the multiple different representations of the different software layers, this enables your programmers to develop software much more quickly, maintain that software if you need to change things much more easily. It enables significant ease of programming um, and makes the overall um, uh, work uh, required and resources required from your system much uh, less than in the uh, multi-layer system. To explore the benefits and advantages and benefits of this, um, myself and uh, uh, a couple of my colleagues have, for the last uh, four years, have been working on a library called Managed Data Structures to uh, explore and, and uh, provide an, uh, an example of how this might work in practice. <coughs> and the two key benefits of this type of approach, where you're just working with a library linked directly into your application, um, means that you can have significant ease of programming. Application programmers 
create data structures, lists, maps, graphs, whatever they may be, directly in persistent memory by calling the MDS APIs to say, create me a managed data structure directly in persistent memory, and I will read and write through your APIs to this data structure directly in persistent memory. We provide APIs in multiple programming languages as a proof of concept that we can in both uh, managed and unmanaged languages, Java and C++ here. And the programmer simply accesses those um, data structures through references to the data, um, makes direct reads and writes, and then has the ability, once, it has, once they have those data structures in memory, to be able to share those data structures with other processes um, that use them. Remember, we have a large shared pool of non-volatile memory to play with. In order for one data structure to share that data with another, they simply pass a reference to the data structure in persistent memory for another process to be able to use at the same time. And our library provides the appropriate high-level concurrency control mechanisms to ensure that this data sharing can be done safely and providing, ensuring consistent data in the face of multiple processes using this data at the same time. Kim, would you like to go through the next examples? <laughs> So the, can people hear me if I talk into the microphone here? Well, they're sort of, yeah, sort of. Okay, maybe, maybe we actually need to I can give you this, too. Um, let's try this for now. How about now? Whoops. Probably turned it off. There you go. Now? Is that better? Okay, awesome. All right, so the, the examples that Susan has gone through really focus on our, uh, how, how we exploit persistent and really large memory, and those two aspects of that you know, Venn diagram that we saw earlier. I'd like to shift the focus now and, and explore what we can actually do with fabric-attached memory as well. And so the work that we've been doing in this space really is, is using a key value store to, you know, to perform this investigation. Uh, you might ask, can I just use a traditional scale-out key value store architecture and just run it on top of the fabric attached memory? Sure, you could certainly do that, um, but it won't allow you to take full advantage of the sharing that's possible with this fabric attached memory. So let's just consider what this architecture is. A conventional key value store uh, basically uses a shared nothing approach. And the idea is to divide up the key space amongst the different nodes that are in the cluster. So each node is responsible for just a part of the key space. And the idea is that clients are going to ultimately try and contact you know, a particular node for the particular request that they care about. They may actually hash the, the key to determine what the appropriate node is themselves, as they do in Redis, or they may actually you know, send a, a message to any of the nodes in the system, which can then proxy to the appropriate node. Um, but so ultimately, though, the, the request is routed to the correct uh, server, and then that server handles the request. That works well, but there's a potential shortcoming if you have very skewed access patterns. If some keys are much more popular than others, then there's the potential for there to be a lot of load imbalance between the different servers here, because some servers are, pop are serving up popular keys, others are serving up less popular keys, and so as a result, there's really not an easy opportunity to balance the load between them if we go with this strict partitioning of the, the, the keys between the different nodes. So we can't really share the, sh the pool of, we can't leverage the shared pool of, of non volatile memory in order to do better load balancing in these skewed access pattern cases. So the work that we're doing uh, and, and have done is to really explore what would it mean to do a shared something key value store, and the idea in that architecture is essentially to store the data in this fabric attached memory um, in such a way that all of the nodes can have access to it. So any node could conceivably serve up a request for any of the different key and value pairs. And so we'll, we'll see um, how this actually works um, in the next couple of slides. The high level architecture, there's really you know, kind of two main pieces of this that, uh, that we've worked on and have open sourced. And so the bottom part is the memory management and how do we allow those nodes to share uh, access to the same memory. And then the top part is really a set of indexes um, that, that we've used to implement the key value store uh, functionality to store the key value pairs and to be able to look up things. And so our goal here is to be able to allow all of the different nodes to have access to the, the, same, the same data sets and to be able to serve up requests. Any node can service any request. And the way that we're going to do that is to use the fabric attached memory as well as the memory semantic primitives, so things like atomic operations, um, in order to allow us to provide concurrency control 
fault tolerance, as well as load balancing between the different nodes. Um, and in particular, I want to highlight some of the, the work that we've done on some of the memory management components, as well as the indexing components. The way that we think about memory management in the machine program uh, that, that this work comes out of um, is really as a kind of a two-level memory allocation and, and management scheme. And so at the kind of the base level of things, we want to be able to allocate chunks of memory. So think about this. We're talking about 160 terabytes of, of uh, fabric attached memory in the prototype that we built that Susan mentioned. So we want to be able to start by allocating very coarse granularity kind of blocks to, uh, to the nodes to be able to share. And then from there, we can have a second level of memory management that will actually provide finer grain access you know, in a way that is tailored to the applications that want to use it. Um, so at that coarser level uh, is what's illustrated here. And so the, the, the metaphor that we've been using is a, of a library and a librarian who is the, the entity that's responsible for making all the good decisions uh, about how to allocate and share memory. And the, the allocation units are are in terms of what we call books. So it's an eight gigabyte chunk. And you can actually group together multiple books into a shelf. And the shelf is the, the entity that's going to then be exposed by the librarian to the rest of the, the nodes that are, are running uh, applications. And so the way that we've chosen to expose this to, to those applications is through a file API. And so we're calling that the librarian file system. You know, that's a little bit confusing for folks that associate other things with LFS, but work with me here for a moment. <laughs> um, and so, so this librarian file system is then used to expose these shelves. A shelf has a name, you can uh, mem map it, um, and then be able to use that either to build a file system on top of or to have an application framework, such as the managed data structures framework running on top of it, or in our case, we can run a key value store on top of it. So this is the basic level, sort of that coarse grained allocation. Uh, the next level of, of allocation that we've been looking at is that finer grained allocation. And um, we've layered uh, what we call a non-volatile memory manager on top of that. And so the goal here is to provide that finer grain allocation um, than what the librarian file system provides. And it also is responsible for allowing sharing between the different uh, processes running on potentially different nodes in the system. Um, and it's also for tolerating the failures of those processes and the compute nodes that they're running on. And so the idea is that uh, the, the, the non-volatile memory manager um, will allow us to allocate you know, free and named shelves, these again, these multiples of, of eight gigabytes. And then it will also provide a global addressing scheme. So I want to be able to address a portion of this fabric attached memory. There's this notion of a shelf ID plus an offset within the shelf. And that's a global pointer that will make sense no matter what node that things are operating on. And just then, if I've M mapped that, I need to be able to translate that into the virtual address uh, that's being used on the particular node in question. And so there are two different APIs that we've provided here. One is just to expose those shelves directly uh, through a region API for M mapping purposes. Um, and the key value store uses that for its own internal bookkeeping. But then there's a second API, a heap allocator that we're using so that applications uh, can actually do regular alloc and free calls. And so that can be much smaller granularity for data structure manipulation and so on. Um, and the nice thing about this is that the heap allows us to have an allocation that happens on one node, but then a free operation that can happen on a completely different node. Um, and these, uh, the, the memory manager is actually able to take advantage or take, understand what's going on and also then be able to support that access across multiple different different nodes in the system. And this is a general, you know, a general library that can be actually used directly with other applications. We've happened to use it in the context of our key value store, but this has been independently open sourced. Now on top of that, we're building uh, indexes. And so for a key value store, you might think, well, the obvious data structure here is a hash table because that allows me to do a get or a put of a single key operation. Um, and so we would like to give ourselves the option of eventually having the ability to do range lookups as well. So we've started looking at ordered indexes. The most popular ordered index that you might think of would be a B tree that's used commonly in, in relational databases. A challenge with working with B trees in the context of persistent memory is just that when you add something or remove something from the B tree, that might have a knock on effect. You might then have to dramatically change the structure of the, of the underlying B tree and the intermediate nodes of that B tree. Um, and so as a result, you know, it's, it becomes more challenging to do that in an all or nothing atomic fashion. So instead, there's some uh, interesting work that, you know, the community is really recognizing that radix trees or compact, uh, compact prefix tries are actually uh, an, another alternative that provide ordered indexes, but that have much better properties for operating on top of non volatile memory. And in fact, there was a, a paper earlier this year in FAST um, from some of the folks at UNIST that looked at a write, a, a, a write optimal radix tree for, um, for looking at non volatile memory. 
So we're going to apply it here in the context of fabric attached to <coughs> little memory. And so the basic idea is that, you know, as you can see, you know, there are, so this is the list of things that is represented in this, this radix tree is shown on the left there. Um, and so we have Romain, Romanus, and all these words that are hard to pronounce, I guess, and Ruber. Um, and so, so the idea is that we look for the shared prefixes, and then we can actually compact those and only store the kind of the, the, the common prefixes as, as to what the intermediate nodes of our, of our tree look like. Um, and so the idea is that if we want to be able to add something or remove something, we can do that with a combination of, of operations where we can basically do copy and write kinds of operations. And then with an atomic operation, you know, atomically then install those updates into the, the, the radix tree. So that you know, the, the, the new material, it goes from not being visible to being visible in, in a in single instruction. So let's just look at an example of how that would work. So if we wanted to add the word radix to this particular, um, this particular radix tree, um, we would allocate the space for the value, zero, as well as the, the leaf node that has this, the, the, uh, the unique suffix uh, associated with radix. Um, and then in that single atomic operation, we could actually add the pointer that would install it into the rest of the tree. And so as a result, um, you know, these radix trees are more amenable to fabric-attached non-volatile memory than B trees would be because they have this more localized kind of update pattern um, that allows us to, to take advantage of these atomic operations. And again, this is a library that we've also um, open sourced as part of the work that we've been doing. So this is just scratching the surface of some of the work that we've done, uh, what Susan and I have described. Uh, there, are, there are a number of other pieces of software uh, libraries that we're also making available to the community, and some of those are shown here. I know this is a busy slide, but let me just try and walk you through some of the aspects of it. So on the, the bottom right-hand side, we have a series of, of emulation and simulation tools. So you can actually um, inject delays if you want to emulate uh, fabric attached, or if you want to add, uh, emulate a persistent memory of a variety of different speeds. We also have the ability to do fabric attached memory emulation by having a virtual machine that acts as a node, and then you have a, a shared set of, of actual physical memory underneath that plays the role of the fabric attached memory. So both of those emulation tools are available. We also have the, the librarian and the librarian file system, as well as some other modifications that we've made to Linux uh, to allow Linux to operate any world of fabric attached memory in a non-coherent uh, processing kind of an environment. So those are uh, extensions to the, the PMIO libraries to handle the non-coherence, as well as uh, libraries to handle the fabric attached memory atomic operations. And then finally, you know, in the in the data management and programming framework space, you know, we've talked about some of these uh, some of these projects, but we also have other um, uh, non-volatile memory programming kinds of, of uh, favorite frameworks, things like Atlas as well as NVThreads, as well as checkpointing libraries uh, and and uh, modifications to uh, Spark to make it run in a large memory environment. So lots of good stuff there. And then finally, at the application level, we've got a couple of application uh, examples looking at image search as well as large-scale graph inference. So that's you know, a whirlwind tour through some of the examples of the, the work that we've been doing and, and open sourcing. Um, let's switch gears for a moment and think about this question of is persistent memory memory or is it storage? So let's see a show of hands. How many people think it's memory? Okay, yeah, we've got a fair number of people. How many people think it's storage? How many people think it's both? Yeah, all right, that's, I'm, I'm with you on that. So um, when, when someone asked us this question earlier this week, you know, we basically said yes, it's both of those things, depending on how you look at it. So we've spent a lot of time talking about how persistent memory looks like memory and how we can treat it like memory. Because we have you know, the ability to you know, avoid layers of software, we can pass references back and forth and whatnot. Um, but if we want it to have the properties of storage, if persistent memory is gonna be the new storage, then it has to actually safely remember <laughs> persistent data. And there may be a little bit more work to be done in order to make sure that that can be true. So if, if, if persistent data should be stored basically in, reliably in the face of failures, it should be stored securely in the face of various exploits, it should be stored in a cost-effective manner, um, as Carolyn was, was mentioning earlier, um, and then it should also be using a data access API that makes sense for the underlying, uh, underlying device that we're, that we're looking at. And so let's just explore some of these ideas in a bit more detail. If we think about, you know, would you entrust your persistent data to some of these new memory technologies? Well, if you're going to do that, you need to be able to deal with the fact that non volatile memory may not always work. There may be endurance issues, you know, like any device, it may fail. Um, we also need to deal with the fact that 
the actual devices themselves could be stolen or there could be software exploits that would actually um, violate the security of the data that's being stored there. Um, so there are lots of challenges that, that still need to be addressed. The good news is that the storage community has spent decades thinking about these issues, right? So there are lots of techniques that we can draw on for thinking about replication, erasure coding, uh, encryption, compression, deduplication, and so on, we're leveling. Um, and so the challenge really here is how do I apply these ideas in a context where we're operating at you know, orders of magnitude faster speeds than we are with traditional storage devices? Um, so it's memory speed, not storage speed. Um, so these traditional Solutions also are going to complicate some of the benefits that we see from the, the new direct access technologies. So think about if you've encrypted something or compressed something in memory, now that's going to kind of get in your way of being able to directly access it without doing some amount of decryption or, or uh, decompression. And so there's also a question about space efficiency and how can I do that in a, in a, uh, in a how can I store redundancy uh, in a space efficient fashion given that these technologies are going to be perhaps more expensive than other parts of the memory hierarchy. So lots of different potential solutions here. You know, one would be that we could just go and implement all of these ideas in software, um, the way that we've done sometimes in, in the context of storage today. That's certainly an option, but it's not, it's gonna mask some of the benefits of the new technologies, as you can imagine. Um, and so as a result, we are expecting that there'll be more combination of hardware and software kinds of techniques that are being used here. So for example, we may want to employ hardware acceleration for certain kinds of common operations. So things like DMA style data movement, between different parts of the system, or being able to zero memory or copy things, um, and uh, you know potentially be able to do encryption or compression or even redundancy uh, schemes. So an open question for the community is really what are the kinds of functions that are ripe for this type of hardware acceleration? Um, and so that's something for us to all talk about together. Um, in addition, we can think about wear leveling uh, in the context of non-volatile memory. Uh, and so you know, there are lots of discussions about you know, what's, the, what's the life cycle of, of these kinds of new technologies. And so repeated accesses may certainly exacerbate the, the, wear, uh, the wear issues, um, especially if I'm trying to coordinate through memory. So then there's potentially some, some additional uses uh, for memory in, in the process. So what's the right balance between having some flavor of hardware-based uh, assisted wear leveling versus relying on our application software or middleware to actually do that for us? And then finally, if, if we want to understand what's going on in our memory system, you know, what's the equivalent of smart for non volatile memory systems that will allow us to be able to you know, give the telemetry and to be able to report what's going on in a way that we actually can uh, understand what has happened, what will happen, and so on. Another question is, you know, low store accessible memory is not necessarily going to be the most cost effective form of storage for forever data, you know, data that's potentially very cold and not going to be accessed very often. And so, you know, echoing some of the things that I heard uh, Carol say this morning, um, we need to find the right the right storage tier for the, the right type of, of data accesses. So you could imagine that, you know, now we've got different different types of uh, technologies that are best matched to the particular kind of access that we're looking at. So, you know, we may choose to put scratch or ephemeral data in the faster storage, you know, use, um, use our persistent, uh, persistent memory to store, you know, temporary results or results that I will, I'm actively accessing. And then finally, you know, store, store things more durably or in an archival fashion on slower storage technologies. So how do we actually manage this memory hierarchy um, so that, that we can ensure that the data is in the right tier when we need it to be? And then a final question is really around what's the appropriate API for the technology? Uh, and so we've talked a lot about memory and load store access to persistent memory technologies, and that's a really great thing, but that's going to work well to a point, you know, to, if essentially if, if the memory latencies are in the hundreds of nanoseconds and lower, that'll be great. Um, but then as we start creeping up higher, um, we, you know, the, the load to use latency for all of the different things that we're trying to do here, you know, might be too long for processors to really want to wait around for in a synchronous uh, fashion. So then we start to think about more I.O.-like interfaces, read or write or get put, that would make sense for those longer latencies. And you'll notice that there's definitely a gray area in there, uh, you know, in the couple of hundred nanoseconds to low number of microseconds, where for some applications, it might still make sense to do load store access. For others, maybe it doesn't, um, depending on what the, what the, you know, the synchronicity um, and, and sharing patterns are. All right, so just wrapping up, um, those are some of the ideas that, you know, that we have um, for, uh, persistent memory as memory versus storage and some of the open questions uh, that, uh, that we need to be able to address in order to really truly store persistent data uh, in these new technologies. Um, 
If you're interested in learning more about some of the work that we've been doing in the memory driven computing space, um, there's certainly a lot of things that are published on our, on our machine page. We also have a machine user group um, that is uh, allowing people to have you know, dialogues with one another, dialogues with the folks that are working on these projects. Um, and, uh, and then the, the memory driven uh, computing developer toolkit is also some of the product of, of that machine user group. Um, finally, we're also on social media. So to wrap up, you know, as we've seen, persistent memory at, uh, is blurring the line between storage and memory. Um, new technologies like Gen Z memory, semantic fabrics, uh, and whatnot, the combination of these different things are really allowing us to rethink programming models and rethink how we want to think about data management, to simplify the software stack, to enable us to focus on memory format persistent data. Um, and it really allows us to rethink things all the way up the stack from the low level, uh, you know, sort of operating system kinds of things, all the way up through the application. Um, we have some initial ideas and some initial forays into that space that we've shared, uh, but we think that there are many more opportunities for innovation. And so we'd encourage you to think about how would you exploit memory-driven computing. So with that, I'll pause and uh, see if there are any questions. <laughs>